Welcome back to the SEO Weekly, where queries are weird, advice is controversial, and everything depends. I'm your host, Garrett Sussman of iPoll Rank, and every week I cover everything going on in the world of SEO. We're talking Google updates, blog posts, SEO Twitter, podcasts, webinars, tools, features, you name it, I'm on it. If you're into this stuff, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, give us a like, leave us a comment, share on the socials. I genuinely appreciate it. We were off last week, so double the SEO weekly packed into one tight episode. Well, it's not tight because I love talking about this stuff, but there was a ton that happened, including Google trying to articulate the difference between their Google search ranking systems and Google algorithm updates, how they're going to explain that in the future and how they're kind of revamping the way they talk about it. We had two awesome episodes of SEO Battle Zone, including controversial, does Google actually incentivize copycat content? And e-commerce and JavaScript common mistakes all over the place. How do you avoid it? We love talking about JavaScript SEO here. So much more. Let's dive in. SEO is so freaking hard because ultimately Google is a big black box. We know that Certain things get ranked for certain reasons. Historically, we were told in the past that there are 200 ranking factors, but Google's moved away from ranking factors. They haven't always been transparent about how they're updating their automated ranking systems. And that's what it is. It's an automated ranking system, a series of algorithms that decides what are the best results based on the query. Now, this year has seen a variety of updates. We've seen the product reviews update. We've seen the helpful content update. We've seen core updates. Well, Google is trying to be more transparent when they're updating the search ranking systems and you got to give them credit for that. But they realize as they say some things along the lines of like a product reviews update, it's not an update as much as it's an entire new system that they are incorporating into how Google determines what to provide as a result. So they created a blog post, Danny Sullivan put out a couple of weeks ago, how they're going to be more specific in the verbiage that they choose. For instance, the product reviews update is actually a product review system. And in the future, if they improve that system, they will announce an update. There are older systems that have actually been deprecated and either put into you know newer systems or they've been merged with the core ranking system like Hummingbird and Panda. On this systems page, they also explain things like Bird and Mum and the original content system. So it's at least some insight in terms of the way that Google's thinking about content and what they choose or what the algorithms ultimately rank based on the variety of signals and factors, you know, probably thousands at this point, nobody said that, but probably thousands that ultimately impact the search results page. And they explain it in a way that's saying that like things like the core update are, you know, kind of moving the signals and the weights of different things in order to provide the best results. For instance, there was a lot of hoopla recently where there was a comment around backlinks and how backlinks have lost the sort of power. They don't rely on backlinks as much as they did historically. Barry Schwartz covered that in Search Engine Roundtable. So really interesting. As you're diving into documentation, read through all of this, read through the how search works. You know, while people are skeptical about how truthful and honest Google is with their public facing liaisons and representation, they do a great job of trying to inform you, even if Maybe the goal is to provide a better web by kind of pointing you, guiding you a certain direction with the documentation. But I think this is a good step for Google. I think it's helpful to be transparent and it's definitely worth the read. I love that Google is working so hard on just improving their communications with the community. They did a November Google SEO office hours and felt like the whole team was involved on this one. I mean, you had Gary Ilias, Lizzie Sassman, John Mueller, Alan Ken, um, even Dewey Nguyen, who I'd seen for the first time. So very cool. All of them answering questions in this audio only format for office hours. They covered a whole range of topics, everything from uh, dynamic links 
links to website migrations to backlinks, as I mentioned. And that's where, you know, this source of this answer of like, are you, why are you using backlinks as a factor? Uh, I really like the format. They also transcribed all the questions and answers in the Google Search Central blog post. So really useful, a lot of great insights. As always, take a lot of it with a grain of salt, but I think it's really helpful and point you in the right direction. One interesting takeaway that I saw was all around guest posting and whether or not Google would devalue sites for taking posts for money. And it was interesting because Dewey kind of said, he didn't say no, you just kind of implied that if you are taking blog posts for money and the quality of those posts suck, then it is going to impact your site. So it's still about the quality of content and not necessarily just about the fact that you're taking content for money. So really interesting uh, office hours. I like the new format. I hope they keep it this way. It'll be interesting to see what they do going forward, but definitely check out maybe one of your questions was answered. In the world of Twitter, and yes, Twitter still does exist, funny tweet from Cyrus Shepard a couple weeks ago about how Google was 100% confusing Jim Carrey with Paul Giamatti, which is really funny. I mean, you see Paul Giamatti search for him and you see all these Jim Carrey movies and Jim Carrey photos, and obviously that's wrong, and Google gets it wrong, and they did actually fix it the very next day. Uh, it's hard. And that's why the feedback is so important. If you see a specific search result, that's just flat out wrong to let Google know. Side note on that though. One interesting thing I was like looking at SERPs for a iPoll rank sort of holidays campaign that we're doing. Um, keep your eyes peeled for that. But I looked up best holiday movies and Google actually automatically filtered it by Christmas movies, which on the one hand context, I get it. Like we are right by Christmas and that's what you would maybe expect to see if you're searching for best holiday movies. But at the same time, what about Mahanaka movies? What about Halloween movies or Valentine's Day movies? There are situations where Google's trying to refine our search and it just feels like they get it wrong. Either way, funny tweets. Have you seen any ridiculously wrong results from Google? I'd love to hear those. So share those in the comments. So Rand Fishkin of Sparkturo put out really interesting study a couple of weeks ago all around third-party traffic estimates and how closely they match Google Analytics results because so frequently marketers are looking at the data and they realize they think they're looking at apples to apples and they expect these you know data points to match up and they don't and so the question Rand is asking is can we trust these third-party tools to actually say oh this is the correct number for this metric. And what he found was interesting. He looked at SEMrush, uh, Datos, which is a provider, similar web and Ahrefs to see if the results when looking at a bunch of websites compared to user submitted Google Analytics um, data match or how closely they match. Now, across the board, he found that things like SEMrush and similar web were the closest. And that he did find that the results were far from perfect. They were not, you know, matching. I think, uh, you know, for the most part, SEMrush came close to like 40% with similar web came closer to 70%. It depended on the size of the website. One big caveat, and I just think it's worth acknowledging is that some of these studies the methodology has to be incredibly sound. And if there are problems with the methodology, it's hard to depend or take a lot of insights from the study. You know, with a lot of this correlation does not mean causation. And so in this example, Ahrefs data was not correctly interpreted in the fact that their search um, results or their, their search volume, traffic volume was based on organic search. It wasn't the full like GA traffic from everywhere. And so Ahrefs actually looks pretty bad in this study. Now there's a disclaimer, but to some extent, unless Ahrefs was actually scrubbed from the whole report, the damage is kind of done. So I understand why Tim Swallow and Patrick Stocks of Ahrefs were a little frustrated that that wasn't more, um, you know, 
explicitly handled or not explicitly, but like more like, you know, surgery, like slice out all the mentions because we know you'll see a, this like graphic that will mention Ahrefs and people won't see the context, you know, years from now. And that'll still be included in a lot of studies and, and it can do brand reputation. That said, I think it was a, an admirable and interesting attempt at showing, you know, ultimately the problem with third-party tools and that they're not fully dependable when it comes to predicting someone else's, you know, stats, if you don't have that first party data. So something to consider worth reading, reviewing, love to hear your thoughts on that. But uh, obviously these studies are always tricky, always tricky. So a couple of weeks ago, Chris Green put out a really interesting article that takes a bird's eye view of SEO metrics, the value that they provide in reporting, and how you can use them to show the value of SEO. And so what he does is he kind of lays out this, this really great graphic that kind of starts, like tries to show how much the SEO metrics ultimately pro provide financial value versus technical value on a sliding scale. And so on the one end of technical value, he starts with like technical metrics around, you know, crawl requests and crawl errors and page index and using Google Search Console to get those metrics. Then moving forward to visibility metrics and using rank trackers to do that by rankings and the visibility. Then the search engine metrics, so impressions and clicks that you're actually getting from search, traffic driving to your site ultimately, um, and using Google Search Console to track that. And then ultimately your organic sessions, your organic transactions, and your organic revenue, which you can find in Google Analytics. For most businesses, ultimately revenue is the key KPI. It's the most important metric. And so being able to understand those metrics in the context of what's ultimately driving towards revenue is a ve very valuable framework to think about when you're working in SEO, especially as you move up in a managerial or executive position and ultimately reporting on that to the C-suite. So great post, really useful by Chris. Check that out. Okay. So news publisher SEO is has so many unique challenges to it. And one of the biggest ones is how do you handle breaking news? How do you ensure that your news website is the one that shows up first on top stories and Google surfaces and decides that you are like the winner, you know, in a matter of minutes, you know, because it's it's very competitive and very fast. Well, Shelby Blakely and Jesse Wilms, who write WTF SEO newsletter, which is an awesome news SEO newsletter, took the 101 and broke it down both from a content perspective, a process perspective, and a technical perspective. They have a lot of actionable tips to ensure that you are on top of the breaking news, that you put it out quickly, efficiently, cleanly, and you have everything that Google and users are searching for when they want to find whatever's happening. Because ultimately, if you get that win for your news publication, that can drive a ton of search traffic and it can also kind of lead to future evergreen SEO wins along the way as well. If you can drive you know, all the traffic to anything else you've covered about that breaking topic, obviously we can't predict the future, but if you have the processes in place to be able to roll it out quickly, fastly and efficiently, you can in fact, win. And definitely subscribe to their newsletter. And if you haven't, watch the uh, Rankable episode where I interviewed these two brilliant women all about news SEO from earlier in the year. Local SEO, how to be a big fish in a small pond. Well, our friends uh, Claire Carlisle and Bright Local put together a awesome course all around how to create content for local SEO. Claire basically has a series of videos all around keywords that you want to target, the top, middle, and bottom of the funnel content, how to get more visible in search for your local geographic area. Remember, you're really focusing on a specific geography and want to create content for that area when people are searching. So there's an exam you can do at the end and get certified. Really great initiative uh, by Bright Local. They've been doing this for over a year now with a variety of different free courses for local SEO. But another one by Claire, check it out. You know it's awesome. Uh, big fan of all of her work. And, and local SEO isn't, isn't necessarily easy. So there you have it.
So backlinks aren't what they used to be. We know from the earlier mention of the Google Office Hours that they have devalue backlinks, at least that's what they say. But honestly, if you ask any SEO, they probably would still argue that backlinks are a top three to five ranking factor when it comes to visibility in the rankings. However, quality of your backlinks is what matters more than quantity. Well, there's a great uh, updated article by uh, Jenny Abu Abaya on Ahrefs all about how to use HARO and alternatives to get killer backlinks. Now, if you don't know what HARO is, that's an acronym for Help a Reporter Out. It is a system that journalists use to basically reach out to experts and get quotes that can be used in their articles. And so it's a whole built out system. It's all free for you to participate. And so Jenny goes through and provides examples of how to use the system, how to identify opportunities, how to use Ahrefs, obviously, to find the domain authority of the websites that are asking for your quotes, and then ultimately how to put together a great pitch that is included and get that backlink back to your site. Two other or three other uh, sites or, or, or services like this that are free that are worth definitely checking out are Turkle, um, Help a B2B Writer, and then Press Plugs. Those three are similar, slightly different demographics, but all worth using to get your quote in someone else's article for a high domain authority type of website and earn that awesome backlink. Uh, good article, really helpful. Check it out if you do any sort of digital PR or backlink. So last week, Chris Silversmith wrote an awesome deep dive on search engine land all around doorway pages. He talked about the history of these slightly manipulative pages that, uh, you know, website developers and content creators would create to ultimately kind of get people, they would use a whole for variations of a certain URL or create a whole bunch of duplicate content and, and target various services in a city that didn't provide a lot of value for your users. Now, it's still relevant in the fact that when Google recently updated their webmaster guidelines to the Google Essentials, they still called out in their spam policies, doorway pages. Chris explains what they are, how you can avoid using them, how you can make sure that that doesn't ding your website because they don't provide value to the users. One interesting call out that he uh, provides in the post is all about category pages, which can be confusing because categories are a sort of search results page. But if you take the time to build out helpful content on your category pages, that's not necessarily going to be considered a doorway page Great article by Chris. Definitely check it out, especially if you don't know, if you're using program, programmatic SEO and you don't know if some of your pages would be considered doorway pages. Okay, so we're almost at the end of 2022, and that's really a lot of budget planning season and when it happens. And so if you have remaining budget for your marketing, it's really important that you end up using all of it because the way that a lot of businesses work is that if you don't use all of your budget in 2022, for instance, the C-suite will say, oh, well, you didn't need all this money. So we're actually going to reduce your 2023 budget. That's why it's so important to make sure you use it all. And so what should you do with that remaining budget? Well, you could put it towards advertising, but they're short-term gains and they don't always provide the long lasting value that will help you hit your 2023 goals. So on iPullRank, Andrew McDermott actually put together a whole list of ideas of how you can use your end of year marketing budget, how companies are thinking about it in the context of the recession, how you can make your case to ultimately use that budget, and why you should actually really consider the compounding value of SEO investment as opposed to advertising. For instance, keyword research, is critical these days. I mean, consumer behavior is changing as a recession comes in. It's never a better time to look at how you're targeting your keywords, looking at the buyer's journey of your audience, and adjusting your SEO and content plan accordingly. Great article, technical SEO audits, you know, looking at your content, updating content, so many projects that you can go. Make sure you use that budget so you don't get 2023 budget sliced. Trust me. Trust me. Okay.
JavaScript SEO. We love it, folks, here at iPull Rank. Well, uh, Justina Jarosh wrote a great article on the Moz blog all about four common mistakes that e commerce websites make using JavaScript. And so, basically, what she did, Justina addressed all of these potential issues when JavaScript doesn't render content properly and it's not even available to be indexed, how problematic that is for visibility and traffic to your website. So a couple of errors that she pointed out, and what I love about this article too, is she identified like guilty parties, websites that actually, you know, made the mistake and then websites that are doing it right. So you can at least see in practice how that could happen and how you can avoid that yourself. So for instance, using page navigation, um, using JavaScript, so like infinite scroll. And if it keeps going and going and going and going, then potentially content might not actually be indexed by Google and crawled and, and, showed up. Uh, number two was generating links to a product carousel with JavaScript. She points out that it's very important to see what's being rendered. Uh, and sometimes if the JavaScript isn't rendered, that content is completely invisible and can't even get indexed. Another big one is when you're accidentally using the robot text file to block J, uh, JavaScript files, which obviously things aren't going to work if Google can't even crawl those resources and then inject those links properly. And then finally was removing main content from the website. So when JavaScript actually doesn't get rendered altogether and removes content from the website, that's going to obviously impact your rankings and impact your, your crawling of the content because it's not going to get crawled. It's not going to get crawled. Anyway, a great article there by Justina. Definitely check that out. We love our JavaScript SEO, don't we, folks? Okay, so if you enjoyed our own Mike King's uh, article around why AI content is not a threat to SEO, and you are obsessed with this topic of AI content, which seems to be a really hot trend at the end of 2022 going forward, well, Andy Volpini of WordLift put together an awesome, epic, epic article all about generating AI for SEO. And so what he did is he goes through the basic concepts of, of generative AI for SEO, but then he goes into specific text models of how you can use it for internal links or FAQ generation or product descriptions, like the appropriate uses of AI content, AI. Uh, he goes on to talk about like code models and how you can use AI to generate structured data, which is brilliant and should be used. It seems like a smart way. And then uh, also for images, how to create images for SEO using AI, generative AI. Then he goes on to talk a little bit about how to create the perfect prompt because the success of AI content is all around the prompt that you put in and you ask for. And then ultimately, like the future of AI and, and where he thinks it's going. I, I'm not going to do this article justice because it's so deep and actionable and practical and really cool and makes sense and pretty definitive. It is a great second heaping. Like for those of us in the US of Thanksgiving, it's like if you want, well, it's not leftovers because Mike King's post is great. Andy's post is so good. Check it out. Boom. So slightly SEO adjacent, but in the world of tools, Andrew Charlton added to Product Hunt this really cool Google Sheets add-on called Formula God. So speaking of AI, as we just mentioned, what Andrew did is he created this add-on extension that allows you to basically use kind of no code plain speak to create formulas in Google Sheets to do a whole ton of really cool, you know, Google Sheets formulas and SEO processes. Uh, some of the examples that he gives for commands are along lines of like total percentage. So you could ask the AI add on to say, like, calculate the total average percentage from column one to column two, like just write it plain text like that. Or, you know, for VLOOKUPs, if the emails in range one match the emails in column one or range one, return column three. That simple, making it more accessible to use formulas for marketers who don't know the ins and outs. Uh, really cool tool. And I'm sure that SEOs are going to come up with a ton of specific use cases to make their job so much easier. So check out that tool. Really cool by Andrew. You know how we love our semantic SEO, our entity SEO. Well, 
On Twitter, Dr. Marie Haynes pointed out this really cool Google research AI tool. Well, it's a game, Symantris. The idea is you basically get a word and then you say the first thing that comes to mind. And if it's semantically related, if it's related to that topic based on their machine learning data set, it drops down to the bottom and you get some points and you can earn all these points and keep going until you run out of time. The funny thing is, uh, Dr. Haynes mentioned, she's like, I wonder if Google research is having us train this language model to be used in some process in the future. Hopefully, hopefully not the nefarious. I mean, Google does no evil, or at least that that was their model, but really cool, funny, uh, fun video arcade game worth trying. Check it out. And finally, in the world of Rankable, last week I had Olga Zar of SEO Slide talk all about SEO audits. Olga is such an awesome, helpful person in our community. She has her own great YouTube channel, but we talked all about what to look for, her process, you know, common mistakes that she's seen. One thing that I love that she calls out is in CTAs, there's always a nondescript anchor uh, and how you can use some better anchor text to help your internal linking. So great interview there. Definitely check it out. And then we actually have not one, but two rounds episodes of SEO Battle Zone. I chatted with Mike King and Zach Chahaus. The first one was all about whether or not when an algorithm update happens, can you attribute your search traffic fluctuations, losses to the algorithm update and what you should actually do. They went at it, bam, 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 really great episode. And then in the second episode, we talked about the idea of copycat content. So if Google is always saying like in the results page, the top 10 are like the same content, you know, you see that same information across all the different posts, like, is that helpful? That's what Google's incentivizing. So why not just create that copycat content? Mike and Zach talk about why that's a potential issue. They talk about this idea of information gain, how it's going to be more and more important to include something that's slightly different, that's new, that's helpful, that's not just what everyone else is providing because Google will ultimately try to diversify the results because they don't they don't want, you know, the same results coming up, but that's not necessarily the case yet. I think so in the near future. Also, this week final webinar of 2022. Zach and I are going to be talking all about 2023 SEO trends and predictions and fictions and colorful descriptions. It's an SEO trends webinar. It previews into our boring SEO predictions that we ask the entire SEO community all about what their takes are of what's going to be happening in SEO in 2023. You know, naturally talking more AI content, we're talking entity SEO, structured data, you name it, whatever's trending, we're going to cover it. That's it. Obviously, two weeks of SEO Weekly smashed into one. So much great content. I hope you enjoyed it. As always, please subscribe to the channel if you enjoy this. Give us a like, leave me a comment. Let me know what you think. So much fun. I love doing this. There's only one more SEO Weekly before the end of the year. So with that said, we'll be back next Monday. We will catch you then. Have a great week.